hello and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then we cook or sample the food from the case. I'm Stacey Lee. Let's begin. When we hear the name Elliot Ness, we immediately think of the famous lawman, the straight-as-an-arrow cop who couldn't be corrupted, and who is often credited with finally bringing down Al Capone. But after that era of his career, the era that has inspired so many books and films like The Untouchables, Elliot Ness's career continued, and in 1938, he found himself with a serious problem. He had been brought into Cleveland, Ohio and hired to be the city's safety director. His problem? A serial killer that was terrorizing the city and that seemed to be impossible to catch. For nearly four years, panicked citizens had been coming to the police with gruesome discoveries that left them terrorized. Headless bodies kept turning up under bridges, in lakes, on beaches, in rivers, and even in backyards. The killer was always able to commit the murder, dissect the body, dump it, and disappear without anyone getting so much as a glimpse into who he might be. Many times, the victims went unidentified because there was simply not enough of them left to tell who they had been. The worst part? There was almost always evidence that the victims had been mutilated while they were still alive. This killer enjoyed watching his victims suffer. He enjoyed torturing them, and he enjoyed leaving parts of them around the city to ensure that his work would be witnessed by all. Year after year, body after body turned up, and there seemed to be nothing law enforcement could do to stop it. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this case and you know where this is going. This is one of my very favorite true crime stories because I feel like it happened in the beginning of the era where things were starting to change and law enforcement was starting to catch on to killers that took more than one victim. There is an area in Cleveland called Kingsbury Run. It's on the southeast side of Cleveland near the suburb known as Shaker Heights. It runs westward through Kinsman Road and because of its elevation, there is a large natural waterway that carries storm waters into the Cuyahoga River. In the 1930s, the area was inhabited by people suffering horrific poverty. It was basically a shanty town that had been built up on a landfill. The people that lived there were the working poor. They were people who had come to Cleveland for work and then lost their jobs and their homes during the Great Depression. Here's a photo of what the area looked like in 1920, and here's a photo of it in the early 2000s. Now it's an industrial area, but as you can see from the photo, it was a very dirty and cluttered area where the people who lived there barely scraped by. This area served as the killer's hunting grounds, and because of the nature of the people who lived there, they made for easier victims. Kingsbury Run was often called Hobo Jungle because of its many vagrants, and many of the folks who lived there were viewed as throwaways, and sadly, not enough people cared what happened to them. Two boys are playing ball in the slums of Kingsbury Run. The ball got away from them, and as one of the boys went to find it, he found much more than the missing ball. There lay the body of a man, well, part of a man. The first victim was found on Jackass Hill. Yes, that's the real name of the area. I think I know a few people who live on Jackass Hill. This victim was found on September 23rd, 1935. The man was later identified as Edward Andresi. He was out in the open and had been there for two to three days before being discovered. He had been decapitated and his genitalia had been cut off. Upon the discovery of the first victim, as police walked the area, they found a second victim lying just 30 feet away from the first. He had also been decapitated and emasculated, and some kind of chemical had been poured over his skin that caused it to become red and leathery. This victim had been there much longer. They estimate three to four weeks. So he was discovered second, but definitely killed first. This victim was never identified. The police and the public were horrified and figured the men must have been tied together somehow. Perhaps this was a mafia hit. And as gruesome as it was, 
they figured that was the end of it. They were very wrong. In the fall of 1935, a man was walking along the waterway looking for driftwood. He saw a large object that he believed to be a log, but as he got closer, he knew he was wrong. There lay the torso of a body that had no head. These finds were the beginning of this nightmare in Cleveland, and talk of what was happening would soon spread like wildfire throughout the country and even the world. A few months went by, and then on January 26, 1936, a woman's body was found. She had been dismembered completely. She was later identified as Florence Genevieve Polillo, and she had been murdered two to four days before she was discovered. Her body parts were wrapped in paper and stuffed into the corner of an alleyway. The following month, her head was found in downtown Cleveland. Now police were much more concerned. There were far too many similarities for them to ignore. The way this victim had been dismembered was eerily similar to the way the first two had been torn apart. And again, the skin was tanned with some kind of chemical. Now, I do have to mention that I found some contradictory information on this case. Some sources say the two men found on the same day were found first, and some sources say that the woman was found first. More sources say that the two men were found first, so that's the reason I chose to report them as victims one and two. But whenever there's a discrepancy in the information that I find, I like to let you guys know that as well. On June 5th, 1936, two boys who were fishing down by a lake saw a bundle of clothing. They poked at it and the bundle rolled a few feet. And as it rolled, the clothing came away from its contents, a human head. This man, who was the fourth victim, was never identified, but because he had quite a few tattoos, something that was uncommon at the time, he was nicknamed the Tattooed Man. This victim had been decapitated while he was still alive. His head was recovered away from his body, and he had been dead about two days. That summer, two more bodies were discovered. On July 22, 1936, a headless man on the west side of town was found. He had been decapitated while still alive, and his body had been there for about two months. Around six weeks later, on September 10, 1936, another partial body was found. This man was nothing but half a torso. Nothing remained below the hips. Neither his head nor the rest of his body was ever found, and neither of these two men were ever identified. A few months went by, and then it happened again. On February 23, 1937, a second woman was discovered. Again, she had been decapitated. Her head was never found and she was never identified. She became known as the Lady of the Lake because of where she was discovered. The public demanded more action. An emergency meeting was called. Dozens of detectives attended this meeting and the public was invited to listen in. The coroner spoke and described the methods of mutilation and death that they were witnessing. It wasn't standard practice back then for the authorities to talk to the public and reveal details about the case, but the public was so horrified by what was happening, it was almost a must. The coroner told the public that the killer was adept with knives and was skilled and definitely had some kind of medical training. The coroner also said this person had practiced dismembering bodies and they also probably had to be pretty strong to move them. The press began talking about the killer and calling him things like America's Jack the Ripper and the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. People began to whisper that the man might be a doctor or a butcher or maybe just a man who had experience hunting and dressing out animals. No matter how many police they put on the case, no matter how many tips came in from the public, they could not find the killer. On June 6, 1937, another woman was discovered dead. She was decapitated and missing a rib. Why do I find that particular detail so odd? One rib? Like, never mind. The other victims had all been Caucasian, but this was a black woman, and her head was found, so photographs were shown around of the face, but no one could identify her. 
Two of the coroners believe she had been dead for over a year, but others disagreed. So officially, she is listed as victim number eight. But if she was dead for a year, she would actually be victim number six. Just a few weeks later, the body of a man was pulled out of the Cuyahoga River. The body was more intact, but again was missing its head. The man had only been in the water for about two days. His head was never found and he was never identified. I just wonder what was happening to all of the heads. That's nightmare fuel. A month went by and then three and then six. And some people began to believe the killer was gone or finished, but sadly he was not. On April 8th, 1938, the lower leg of a woman washed up on the banks of the river near the West 3rd Street Bridge. After the leg was found, police undertake a massive search of the area, and soon they discover a burlap sack containing the victim's headless torso cut into two halves, a second thigh, and a left foot. Neither the head or the rest of her body were ever found. This victim was found to have drugs in her system, but she was the only victim who did. She had been dead three to five days. On August 16th, another woman was found decapitated. Her head was found near her body. As they searched for the head and found it, they came upon another victim dumped not far from the burlap sack containing most of the woman. This body was a man, he was decapitated. His head was also near the body in a large tin can. Neither the man nor the woman were ever identified. No one knew it at the time, but these would be the last two victims of the serial killer the press was now calling the Torso Murderer. Now I need to stop again and say that officially the Torso Murderer only has 12 victims, but there are a lot of people that believe there are many more. In 1936, a headless body is discovered in a boxcar in Pennsylvania. Three headless victims were found in boxcars in 1940, and all of these victims' bodies bore similarities to the torso murderer's victims. There was even a victim found in 1950 in Cleveland, 41-year-old Robert Robertson, who had been decapitated and his body showed other similarities to previous victims. So again, 12 official victims, but a pretty solid chance there were more. Now, I've brought up Elliot Ness, who was the city's safety director, but we also need to talk about Peter Merlot, who was the lead detective on the case. I imagine his frustration and stress level were through the roof. He was known as a solid cop, and he firmly believed that the killer was either among the hobo population or that he pretended to be part of that population so he could move through it easily. Peter Merlot was under fire. He was incensed that the killer continued to take victims right under his nose and that he could do nothing to stop him. Merlot even spent time riding the trains, dressed as a drifter, to see if he could spot any behavior that might indicate a suspect. So it sounds like Peter Merlot was really in the trenches doing the actual work, but because of Elliot Ness's fame, he is the lawman that is most often talked about when we talk about this case. But Elliot Ness had a secret that he hadn't shared with anyone except this small group of people that he kind of brought with him from Chicago. He had information and just a few people knew about it. For two years, Elliot Ness had been dragging a man on and off the street interviewing him, and he was pretty convinced that he was the killer, but he just couldn't prove it. The public was angry, and because Elliot Ness was the city's safety director, his reputation as the greatest lawman in the country began to suffer. Now, Elliot Ness was a powerful man, and as history shows us over and over, when powerful men have bruised egos, the have-nots suffer. Elliot Ness wanted this case solved, as I'm sure did Peter Merlot and all of the other detectives working the case. Ness had very little to do with the actual investigation, but because of his immense fame as the man who took down Al Capone, he was named often in the press, and he didn't like being associated with these unsolved and continuing murders. On August 24, 1939, a Cleveland man named Frank Dolezal, 
52 years old, was arrested as a suspect in Florence Palillo's murder. Now, the consensus on Frank is, is that he was not the killer. He was just a drunkard, he was a violent man, and they pulled him in because it kind of appeased the public for a minute. No one still living knows what happened in this interview with Frank, but we do know that Frank was not the killer, and we do know that he died in county jail under suspicious circumstances. So most likely one of those, you know, we're going to beat it out of you scenarios that went too far. Now, back to Elliot Ness's great secret. Elliot Ness was convinced that a man named Francis Edward Sweeney was the killer. Francis was a severe alcoholic. He had attended medical school, but struggled throughout, and he most likely had paranoid schizophrenia. But there was something else about Francis. He was a World War I veteran, and his role in the war? Performing quick and efficient amputations of limbs in triage units. He had medical training, and he had a lot of experience cutting people's arms and legs off. Not only was Francis mentally ill, but he had also been incredibly traumatized by the war and suffered with major anxiety and depression because of what he had seen and done in the war. Obviously, today we would recognize that as PTSD, and hopefully there would be treatment available, but remember, this was 1939. Elliot Ness is convinced that this is his man, but he just can't seem to prove it. Homeless people had come forward saying that a doctor had offered them shoes and a meal, but as they began to eat, they would feel dizzy and a few of them knew they were being drugged, so they ran away. The place that this doctor had taken them for their meal was close to where Francis Edward Sweeney practiced surgeries, and it also had access to a morgue next door. This is how Sweeney becomes Elliot Ness's prime suspect. So Elliot Ness, after years of killings go on and on, decides to go rogue. He and his closest men grab Francis Edward Sweeney off the streets of Cleveland. They basically kidnap him and they take him to a suite in the Cleveland Hotel. Francis is such a severe alcoholic that it takes him three entire days to sober up. He's under lock and key and is watched around the clock during those days. When he is finally sober, the interrogation begins. A polygraph is brought in and Francis is given several polygraph tests, which Elliot Ness claims that he failed. Now, we all know that we cannot really rely on polygraph tests, but this is part of the story. Despite sobering Sweeney up, interrogating him, polygraphing him, and probably, let's be honest, slapping him around, Elliot Ness cannot get enough proof that this is his man, but he will not be deterred. These killings are going to stop no matter what, and he decides to take drastic action. If he cannot find a suspect to arrest, he will destroy the area the killings are taking place at. Elliot Ness gathers the police force. They storm Kingsbury Run and arrest anyone and everyone for anything and everything. As these people, already living in desperate circumstances, already struggling to get by every day, are in the city jail, Elliot Ness sets Kingsbury Run on fire and burns it to the ground. I think that is just absolutely awful. I mean, full disclosure, I have done a lot of work with the homeless and I'm aware of the complicated nature of that issue. Um, you have the side of the coin of the people who live that way, and then you have the side of the coin of the businesses that are affected by these people. It's a very complicated issue, and I don't have a lot of patience for the whole go get a job and pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and it's a much more complicated issue than that. And I also feel for business owners that are affected by homelessness, but we don't get rid of homelessness and unsheltered living by destroying what little the people have. That's just not a solution. But a lot of times when people can't find a real solution to a complex problem, they'll settle for brutality, and it doesn't work. It never works. Elliot Ness does not get the reaction that he expects. The public is smarter than he gives them credit for, as is usually the case, and they aren't terribly impressed with this heartless display of power. His abject failure is the beginning of the end for the once great lawman. The Cleveland Torso murderer is never caught. 
No one is ever brought to justice, and to this day, the case remains unsolved. Elliot Ness, ironically, because of his work in the Prohibition era, becomes an alcoholic and dies mostly forgotten at only 57 years old. Cleveland moves on and the torso murderer becomes part of American lore. We will most likely never officially know who the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run was, even though Elliot Ness was sure. Now, as we always do on this particular playlist, we discuss the area where the events happened and we cook or we sample the food from that area. Cleveland has a lot of very specific regional dishes, but one of the most famous ones is called brown sauce. A lot of people have their own version of brown sauce, but the original came from a restaurant called the New York Spaghetti House. It opened in 1927 and closed in 2001. Someone tried to revive it around 2007, but sadly it has closed for good. I kind of hate that. I hate it when those places close, but the sauce was so popular that they actually bottled it and sold it in the stores. Finding this recipe, you guys, <laughs> I don't even know how many hours I put into trying to find this recipe, but I think I might have it. After days and days of digging around, I found on Facebook of all places, a man who claims that he has been working on this original brown sauce episode for decades and he thinks he's got it down pat. His name is John Pompey. I sent him a Facebook message quite a few weeks ago asking, you know, to talk to him, but I never heard back. So if someone who knows John happens to see him or he happens to see this, I'm giving him all the credit for this. I'm really grateful to John and to people like him who preserve these old recipes. Even if they're not perfectly exactly to the teaspoon, they're really, really close. And I think that's important. So right now we are going to make Cleveland's brown sauce from the New York Spaghetti House as we go dining with death. We are ready to cook. We're gonna make this brown sauce. It's a little bit unusual. It's kind of like a bolognese or a ragu, but there's a lot of beef flavored components to it. So let's make this. I hope this is close to the original recipe. And John Pompey, if you're out there somewhere, thank you for this. As always, we start with our prep work. This recipe calls for one cup of grated carrots. It calls for two stalks of celery and it specifically says to include the leaves. The leaves do have a little bit different flavor. We're gonna do one medium white onion, small dice, six cloves of garlic and chop those really fine. I have to say, it also said to include some fresh Italian parsley because of the shortages we're experiencing, my store did not have any. Okay, there are a couple of unusual things about this recipe you'll see as we go along, but the first thing we're gonna do is make a medium dark roux, which those of you that cook Italian food, you know that's not how a sauce starts. All in all, we're gonna need a cup of olive oil, but we're gonna start with half a cup for the roux, and the other half a cup is gonna be used later on. To that olive oil, over the heat, we're gonna add a cup of flour. Now I am following the recipe to the T on this one because I want it to be as close to the spaghetti house recipe as possible. The recipe says to cook this roux until it is the color of peanut butter. A roux is always fat and flour and it's used as a thickening agent or as a base. Whenever you're making a roux, you wanna make sure, even if it's a blonde roux, a light roux, that you cook it until the raw flour taste is gone from it. So it's always a couple minutes. This one's gonna be a lot longer. Okay, the roux is now the color of peanut butter, like the recipe says, and we're gonna set that aside. Okay, next step, get yourself a stock pot. We're gonna add the rest of the olive oil to the pot. To your hot olive oil, you're gonna add the vegetables that we prepared earlier. Start with the onion. We've got the celery with the leaves. And we've got the shredded carrots. So basically we've made a mirepoix. Now we're gonna add the garlic in a minute, but I like to add my garlic at the end of the cooking or the sweating process because I do not like it when it browns. Okay, the vegetables have sweated, kind of married together, so I'm gonna add the garlic. 
Okay, it says to cook until the garlic begins to slightly toast. All in all total, it will be around 10 minutes for the vegetables. Okay, the vegetables are soft and the garlic is starting to toast and brown. So we're gonna go to the next step. You add a 28 ounce can of crushed tomatoes. I held that far away so the camera could catch it and it just splashed all over me. So, oh, hold on a sec. I had a tomato facial. You add a quart of beef stock. And here come the spices. Two tablespoons of Italian seasoning. Two teaspoons of basil. A teaspoon of thyme and a half teaspoon of crushed red pepper. Two teaspoons of salt. Two bay leaves and a teaspoon of sugar. Okay, here comes some of that unusual beef flavor I'm telling you about. Two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. We need a cup of red wine. Okay, here is where this sauce gets very different from most sauces that you're used to. It says, add the meat in chunks raw, do not brown, or raw meat to sauce, but we're just more used to browning it. Okay, I've got three quarters of a pound of ground pork and three quarters of a pound of ground beef, and it says specifically to use 85-15 ground beef. That means it's 15% fat. Add it in chunks. Another very unusual element for sauce, it says to take one can of cannellini or great northern beans, blend them in the water that they're in and add it. Okay, those beans are blended. I'm gonna add them to the sauce. The recipe says to bring the mixture to a boil and let it simmer for 45 minutes. So I'll see you in a little bit. Our sauce has simmered for 45 minutes and you can see inside the pan where it's reduced about an inch. The next step is to add the roux that we made in the very beginning. You can see it looks just like peanut butter and if you're worried about it being lumpy in the sauce, you don't need to be because there's another unusual step coming. After you add all of the roux, you're gonna let this cook for 15 more minutes and then that way the roux melts and incorporates into the sauce. So that will definitely help with the lumps. But after it cooks for 15 minutes and incorporates, the recipe says to take an immersion blender and blend this about halfway down. So again, an unusual step. The recipe actually says, don't blend too much, you still want some meat granules. So some texture to the sauce. I can really see why this needs the roux because even after this simmered for 45 minutes, it was still pretty runny. The roux is gonna really tighten it up, really thicken it up. It has thickened up considerably. It's now got the consistency of a really thick chili. Okay, I'm gonna take that off the heat and we're gonna blend it. Anytime you use an immersion blender, you wanna make sure it's all the way down in the liquid before you turn it on. You don't turn it on and then put it in because it's gonna splatter everywhere. It's hot, you're gonna get hurt. You can see that there is still some texture to the sauce, but it is relatively smooth. I've got a bowl of cooked spaghetti. We've got our brown sauce. Let's plate this up and try it. Get a nice big ladle of this sauce. It's very unusual. I know I keep saying that, but it is. I don't know if it's the most appetizing thing I've ever seen, but we're gonna give it a taste. Sometimes the best dishes aren't so pretty. I'm a little interested because this recipe does not call for any black pepper, which is something you don't normally see. The New York Spaghetti House brown sauce.
that is unusual. It's good. It tastes more like beef gravy than it does any kind of marinara or ragu or bolognese. You can definitely tell there's a roux in there. The texture has that roux-like texture. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna taste just the sauce. It doesn't taste like it. I can't compare it to anything. I, I just, it doesn't taste like anything I've ever had before. It's kind of chilly. It's kind of gravy. It's kind of pot roast juice. It's kind of spaghetti sauce. And it is definitely brown. It is brown sauce. <laughs> Thank you for joining me today on this episode of Dining with Death. I sure appreciate you spending a few minutes of your day with me. Like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Like I always say, it helps me out a lot. Stay safe and be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.